Hi, uh, welcome back to another episode of Coin Life. With us today, we have Ken Timsit, the Managing Director of Kronos. Now, Ken, for the sake of our viewers, could you please explain more about what Kronos does and its position in the crypto trading ecosystem? Kronos is what we call a layer one chain. Kronos differentiates itself in two main ways. From a technical standpoint, it is the first EVM compatible chain built on the Cosmos SDK. Uh, so in a way, it acts as a chain that connects and is interoperable both with the world of Ethereum chains and the world of Cosmos. Uh, and then from an ecosystem standpoint, uh, the main differentiation is that uh, we have a strategic and technical partnership with Crypto.com, uh, one of the world's largest exchanges with 50 million users, which gives us access to a very rich uh, ecosystem of users willing to try out new applications. Yeah. Are there any exciting projects that Kronos is currently working on that uh, you, know, you can share with us? We have more than 300 dApps. Our focus um, is primarily on consumer applications. Those are in two main verticals. Uh, on one hand, decentralized finance. Uh, on the other hand, NFTs and Web3 games. So in uh, DeFi, we all, of course, uh, have applications that cater to the foundations of any decentralized finance ecosystem, such as decentralized exchanges uh, like VVS and MMF and decentralized lending and borrowing protocols uh, like Tectonic. We're seeing you know, more uh, sophisticated apps coming up, for example, protocols to trade perpetual. Uh, and there are projects that are also trying to make DeFi simpler for users. In NFTs and Web3 Gaming, uh, it's all about uh, giving real in-game utility to NFTs uh, so that people uh, own collectibles that are really useful in the game. So briefly, how is the company coping in the current bear market? I think especially in the realm of game fight, it's not easy to create a good game that can retain its player base. I think a lot of people are you know, having second thoughts about entering into the game fight space. First of all, it's important to highlight that we're not specifically in a crypto bear market. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in a global economic yeah. downturn. Uh, so economic conditions are hard for everyone. To some extent, it's normal that they're focusing more on their livelihood and their families than you know, on playing games or investing in DeFi. Yeah. Like everyone, uh, coping with those economic conditions uh, by uh, preparing for when the market will be more exciting again. And like many other builders or entrepreneurs are saying, I think uh, there is a silver lining to the bear market, uh, which is the ability to take our time to build uh, applications on stronger foundations. The earlier Web3 games uh, had a token economics that were a little bit too simplistic and assumed that later players would pay for the gains of earlier players and that everyone would just make money simply by playing. We have a bunch of teams in our ecosystems thinking about how to make those gaming economics more sustainable. Not everyone should expect to earn just by playing. Uh, if you're playing a game, you should play primarily for entertainment. And then some users will earn, uh, either because they are early adopters and contributed to the game in a meaningful way. The bear market is a good opportunity to work on those things without uh, having to rush and keep up with the market. So what are your thoughts generally on Emerge? I, I know there's a lot of talk about you know, how the POS system is now really green, is really sustainable. Um, but beyond that, is, is it really all that great? Overall, I'm very positive about the Emerge having happened, proved that a decentralized community of open source developers can uh, work together and deliver a major technical migration. Secondly, um, for sure, the heavy environment footprint of Ethereum was a major blocker for many users to adopt crypto. So uh, Ethereum energy consumption has been reduced by something like 99.5% and that's great. Um, however, uh, it's just one problem solved. A uh, big one, but, and there are many more problems to be solved. The merge is not going to reduce transaction fees or increase Ethereum scalability in a meaningful way. Alternative L1s like uh, Kronos uh, are among the chains that solve this problem. Uh, on Kronos, a uh, basic transfer only costs one cent. Secondly, we can go further in terms of uh, environmental sustainability. For example, you know, Kronos is carbon neutral now. Um, and thirdly, there are all kinds of other uh, hurdles for new users, such as the ease of on-ramp and off-ramp, the quality of the user interfaces, and all those things are 
uh, strategic themes for us as Kronos, uh, if we consider that our mission is to bring the next billion users to Web3. Right, for sure. So do you think that the merge can have the capability to bring more people into the crypto space? I think you mentioned earlier about sustainability and that kind of lowers the barriers of entry for some people, um, especially those who are more environmentally conscious. But is there any other way that you think the merge can bring more people in, in its current state or, I don't know, maybe a few years in the future? No, so, no, I think right now uh, the merge is really about reducing the environmental yeah. footprint of Ethereum. So it does bring more people to crypto in the sense that there were people for whom that was a, a hurdle. Uh, but that's probably the main contribution of the merge to um, greater adoption of Web3. Other uh, improvement areas exist when it comes to uh, improving access to blockchain. The merge doesn't solve those, and we, as well as others, are, are working on solving those other problems that are also important. Right, for sure. So you're kind of taking the merge and just finding out which are the holes that hasn't been filled, and then going in to fill those as an L1. Exactly. Perfect. All right, so now we're going to go on to some general questions um, regarding Kronos' business model. So I understand that Kronos is built on Ethermint, uh, which allows for the porting of smart contracts from Ethereum. Could you tell us more about what smart contracts are, and why are they so important for the people? Smart contracts are pieces of automated code once deployed onto a public blockchain network can uh, self-execute, right? so ex be executed by anyone without relying on a central server or a central operator or central intermediary. So smart contracts are really the foundation uh, of everything uh, that is right now interesting about Web3. Uh, it's the foundation of programmable money, it's the foundation of decentralized uh, applications and, ten and tenants' protocols. So Web3 is not just about uh, putting all um, payments and transfers onto uh, digital channels. Yeah. Blockchain is really about uh, creating an open ecosystem when, where there is no word garden and no one who controls your account, where you own your own uh, assets. Like centralization. Right? Exactly. So uh, smart contracts are essential in the sense that, first of all, they allow your accounts to be managed by yourself. Yeah. Uh, but they also are essential in the sense that they enable the composability of accounts and applications, which is the core of why decentralized finance is so, in, is so innovative. You know, when your accounts are in a bank, only a bank can authorize uh, access to those accounts, but also can authorize your subscription to additional products that rely on those accounts, such as loans, uh, insurance policies, um, uh, access to investment products. In Web3, all applications are built on top of each other. You have Ether holdings, for example. You're going to stake those Ether holdings uh, into a staking protocol. Uh, you're going to get uh, staked Ether in return. So that staked Ether is another asset, but that staked Ether can then in turn be used as a collateral to take a loan uh, or as a uh, source of liquidity if you want to invest uh, this staked Ether into a decentralized exchange. And so the composability of those applications altogether is really what makes uh, Web3 so rich in terms of innovation. Uh, and I think it's really essential to the um, uh, value proposition that we are offering to users. Right, so it kind of diversifies your assets and repurposes them into whatever way you wish without the fear of centralized authority. Exactly. So there have been mounting concerns on governance for social fi and game fi platforms. Do you think that DAOs, for instance, are effective in protecting users, especially on these platforms? Why or why not? DAOs right now have not proven very effective in handling day-to-day -day operations. You can think of DAOs as effective in terms of establishing uh, strategic uh, orientations and the principles that bring the community together the DAO is only going to be as effective as the group of people who uh, have been entrusted by the DAO to manage those operations. What we can expect is that as DAOs become uh, wealthier and more successful, they will be able to entrust those operations to more experienced operators. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now, many of those community members uh, are still uh, learning while doing, building the plane as, it, as, as they're flying it, if you will. Uh, and so there is still a lot of experience that they need to gain in terms of being uh, effective content moderators. Yeah, for sure. So I think um, at, at the moment, DAOs in its current form can't really do much beyond code appropriate tasks, if you think about it, like bookkeeping, like digital signature verification and stuff like that. So ultimately, you still need a certain community or sub-community, as you mentioned, to run these DAOs to make sure that the moderating goes well. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. I think that concludes our interview. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you.